Welcome to the Defense and Airspace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the conclusion of an Atlantic Council panel discussion with Ina Eriksson Sarida, who is Norway's uh, foreign minister. And we're talking to George Benitez, uh, who is uh, one of the nation's leading experts on uh, the Atlantic Alliance, an Atlantic Council fellow, and does uh, the NATO, oversees the NATO Source uh, blog. So, uh, George, give us some play-by-play. -play. What are some of the messages uh, that you heard uh, Minister Sarida deliver here? She's heading over to to the White House, you know, do you think that her pleas and the pleas of so many other NATO leaders are going to change the president's fundamental approach to the alliance as he goes into the summit on July 12th? I think the foreign minister gave a very powerful speech, and I think it's definitely the right message to send both not just the United States, but this speech was also intended to her European counterparts. Uh, she's one of the most uh, well-informed and articulate leaders within the alliance, and I think she made a very strong case to say our key challenge here is not a lot of these secondary issues, but the main thing is unity and cohesion within the alliance. NATO has kept the peace and the prosperity of Europe and North America for over 50 years, and I think she says this is something that's too valuable for us to just uh, hurt or or damage or threaten with a lot of our petty disagreements. Um, do you think that there is a danger, as some uh, suspect, that the disunity that we've seen from the G7 um, reducing the alliance in some respects to how much money you're spending, in fact, in some people's estimation, making it worse by putting an economic, you give us trade concessions in exchange for security, uh, you know, as a senior European diplomatic friend uh, told me from, from Rome uh, last week, you know, that's, that's pretty much the worst possible message you could possibly deliver to us. Um, do you think that there's a danger that this will enable Putin to test the alliance in a severe way, in a way that folks don't expect to sort of expand fissures while, you know, weakening the, the alliance? I definitely think that Tom President Trump's approach to the alliance and the words he said and his very negative rhetoric um, have been uh, creating challenges for alliance unity. And I think it actually helps and makes strengthens the case of Vladimir Putin. Um, as Secretary Mattis himself has said, Putin is trying to divide the alliance. And I think that the president should definitely change his approach to the alliance and his diplomatic language to uh, be more in, in sync with a positive message to the alliance. Like I said, this is our most powerful and valuable alliance to U.S. national security. Um, there are substantial disagreements that we need to work out. So I think it is something that we need to focus on. But I also think it is something that we need to keep in perspective. Um, do you, you know, you mentioned, invoke the name of Jim Mattis. Um, there isn't a meeting that you don't have with a foreign leader when the question of President Trump surfaces that they don't immediately point out the great relationship they have with Jim Mattis as Defense Secretary. Universally admired, universally respected. But there has been a concern, especially because of changes that have happened in uh, the President's cabinet. Uh, all of that old guard is now gone. He is the last of the old guard, particularly in security, that's still there. And every once in a while, you know, you hear the rumors that Mattis will be leaving um, and, you know, be replaced perhaps by Tom Cotton. What do you think the implications are for the departure of a Jim Mattis. You know, we saw an NBC News story just the, just yesterday talking about how Mattis's influence has been reduced. And that's something in Washington everybody's been talking about, that he was for the Iran nuclear deal, we backed out of it. He was for the climate deal, we backed out of that. He was surprised with the suspension of uh, military exercises in South Korea, uh, said Space Force isn't a good idea. We, the president announces a, a, a Space Force. Um, you know, what are the implications for the departure of Jim Mattis, who is the repository of all the positive chi that the nation still has with its allies to a degree. I think Secretary Mattis has had a very positive impact on the president's views on NATO, um, as some of the things that were brought up by the foreign minister's speech today. Uh, U.S. funding for EDI has increased uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, the position, the request from Norway for more Marines has been uh, being looked at favorably by this Trump administration. Um, Secretary Mattis is a manifestation. Every president brings in intelligent people, influential people to be their cabinet. They don't always agree with the president, uh, but some are on the team and some are not. And Secretary Mattis is definitely on Trump's team. Uh, he is someone that he re recognizes, and he has been very loyal and steadfast in saying he is here to implement the president's agenda, not his own. He is just trying to make that agenda as well informed and as positive as he can for U.S. national security. So you, you're, it's not something that you're necessarily worried about? It's always something of a concern. Uh, particularly with a lot of the personnel issues that have happened in this administration, a lot of the ones that you pointed out. 
Uh, but I think President Trump should realize that Secretary Mattis is a, is a very valuable asset to his administration and is someone that is really helping improve and strengthen U.S. national security. And he's a very experienced hand to help President Trump deal with all of these challenges he's facing, from North Korea to Iran to Russia. Um, any president would be lucky to have Jim Mattis as a Secretary of Defense. Um, I think that uh, when you talk to folks uh, near the, the and close to the secretary, uh, the point that they make is his job is to advise. He executes whatever the boss ultimately um, ultimately uh, does does decide um, w w without without complaint. Um, let me ask you in terms of the upcoming summit. What do you think are going to be the clear deliverables, and what do you think the right the president's approach needs to be for his summit meeting, which is sort of you know, th with Putin that threatens to actually take a lot of the thunder away from the NATO summit. You know, talk to us on both of those aspects. What is it that should happen in Brussels? What is it that should happen in terms of the American president's meeting with Vladimir Putin? You're going to see some improvements of the alliance, some restructuring, some revisions. Uh, you're going to see the continued approval by the heads of state of the two new NATO commands, uh, one here in Virginia, uh, more to resume an Atlantic command for the alliance, uh, which won't be the same as SACLAND, but it will have some of the similar duties and responsibilities. You'll also see Germany stepping up and hosting a new command for NATO. Uh, that's an important step. This one will deal with logistics and mobility for NATO forces in Europe. And you're also going to see uh, something interesting, which we haven't seen in a long time, and that may be another round of NATO enlargement. Uh, the question of the Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg has said that if things work out well in the Macedonia's referendum, then their membership in NATO may very well be on the agenda at the NATO summit. I think that will be a positive sign both for prospective members, for partners, and definitely for Moscow. Um, in terms of what should be uh, addressed at the summit is that President Trump is just focused on demanding everything. Um, when I think he should be a little bit more pragmatic, I think there are uh, lots of good ideas of things that he can expect from the Europeans, um, one of which was my, one of my own, which is that he, instead of EDI continuing to be unilateral, it should be a multilateral thing. The president should go to the summit and ask the Europeans to at least match the uh, f three to five billion that we're investing in EDI. That's a small enough sum that they could do it in a short term amount of time, and it, but yet it's a big enough uh, gesture and the sum that it will show that they're making significant contributions and willing to match us, not just give us more promises. Uh, but what about his meeting with Vladimir Putin? What do you think should be the outcome of that? Because there are concerns, for example, that the president could make an unpredictable and unilateral decision. Uh, for example, with the South Koreans, uh, we not only suspended exercises, but we renamed those exercises war games, uh, which is the exact word that the uh, government for seven decades has said, these aren't war games, they're exercises, uh, and we're not going to accept the, the, the North Korean definition of those. Um, there is a concern by some that the president may make a concession, for example, uh, to the Russians that, that could end up being uh, problematic. What do you think, how do you think that meeting should go, and what is the best outcome uh, from it? And conversely, what would be a bad outcome from it? I think the president should pay a lot of attention to both what his most experienced advisors are telling him about Russia. I think it also should pay close attention to what his Republican-led Congress is telling him about Russia. Uh, they've implemented stronger sanctions on Russia. They're very concerned about Russia's behavior in Ukraine, in Syria, um, and their hybrid warfare all across Europe and even in North America. So I think he should, as the leader of the United States and of the free world, he should definitely convey these concerns to Putin and have a firm position with Putin that says this kind of negative behavior, aggressive behavior to us and our allies must stop, and the U.S. will continue to honor its treaty obligations. George Benitez, thanks very much of the NATO Source blog at the Atlantic Council. Always a pleasure. Pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much for having me.